Hello, and um, so I want to talk about three things, and I'm trying to make this succinct so I can just upload it and and we can have a conversation. So thank you again for all of your responses and questions. I am enjoying the conversation and I want to encourage the conversation. But today I want to talk about three things. And yes, I've been painting this morning, but first I want to talk about um, the term, uh, three terms, okay? Uh, the first one is colorblind. I got a lot of response back from well-meaning, well-meaning people, right? Like. I believe their heart is right in the right place. They, they are now, they are, as they're being exposed to this, they want to know more. But a couple people have responded, you know, that they, um, they just can't even conceive it. They had no idea, and they they are colorblind. This is a term that several people have used, and I know the intention, right? The intention is what they're trying to tell me is when they say I'm colorblind, what they're trying to say is I don't treat people different based on the color of their skin, which is is the goal, right? Like we do want in a way for you to treat people equally um, or not to discriminate against people because of their color, right? That's what we, that is the goal, right? But the goal is not for you to be colorblind. Because to be colorblind, to be blind means you do not see, right? So a lot of people are are in awe or in shock that they didn't know that there were this many black mixed media artists. And I only highlighted a hundred, okay? But they're just in shock that there are that many. And the reason why they're in shock is because they have not seen us. And they have not seen us because because of this safety net of saying I'm colorblind, right? To be blind is to not see, okay? But in order, I don't need you to be colorblind. I need, if you're colorblind, you can't see my experience. You, you don't know my come from. You can't, you, when I tell you that I'm uncomfortable or that, that every time I get in a car, I am consciously thinking about the bad apple cops because they apparently there are a lot of bad apple cops you can't relate and you get on the defensive because one you're colorblind you have put blinders up so that you can't even see that there might be another experience in this country and because you don't know it you can't you can't validate it but that doesn't make it not real right so so we don't need you to be colorblind we don't, right? To be colorblind means you don't see me, you don't see my experiences, you don't you don't see my my struggle, you don't see my joy, you don't understand, you can't see my art. If you are colorblind and I and I color, right? Like for me, it's hilarious that, not hilarious, it's actually sad, right? That that in the art space, right, we would be colorblind. What do we do if not highlight and play? and enjoy and celebrate color. Yes, we're mostly we're talking about paint, but the fact that we understand that color is powerful, that color is beautiful. But then when it comes time in real world, we try to say, well, oh, I don't see color. You know, as, as my son would say, throw a flag on that play, throw a flag on the play, right? Like, no, that's a foul. That's not a true statement. We don't need you to be colorblind. I need you to, to actually see color. Because when you start to see color, you can start to see patterns, right? Our pain is an accumulation of pain. It's centuries of pain. We are in grief, not just for George Floyd, but for the countless other individuals, innocent individuals who have lives have been taken at the hands of someone whose oath is to protect and serve, right? I understand the whole, you throw in the argument, well, black people are killing black people, white people are killing white people. That don't mean we don't, we just throw it all out. I mean, you can't, that's a, that's a terrible argument. That's a deflection argument. We're not going there, right? Bottom line is, I, I don't need you to be colorblind. I actually need you to be, I need you to move. There's like a continuum, right? I need you to take off your blinders 
and see. And so the next phase would be color aware. Most of us are coming into this color awareness, like, okay, I need to take her off and see. And I want to tell you a story because I think for me, this kind of drives it home. Um, you know, if you're born black in this country, uh, you're always aware of color, or at least very early, you are made aware that you, ha you that your skin is different than other people, right? <laughs> right? Like your skin is different than what you see on TV. Your skin is different than than most of the teachers. Your skin is different depending on how you are brought up than people around you, right? Um, so you you become very aware of that. And I I got, um, and so it's almost becomes normal, right? Becomes normal, um, that awareness for us, right? That awareness of color is, is normal. We're brought up to be aware of color. Um, but I did not understand that that's not the case until uh, I was in high school. So my best friend, one of my best friends in high school, her name was Sarah. And um, Sarah and I, for four years, had most of the same classes. We were both in the gifted and talented program. And, uh, you know, I was always one of maybe two um, black students in the class, but I got used to that, right? Like that became, that became my norm, that became my storyline. So because I was an army brat, I, I had already built up coping mechanisms to make friends quickly. So I got to this new school my freshman year and, and I'm in this program uh, this gifted and talented program, and so I'm 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 one or two, one or two strong, right? And so I I am of the elf that hey I'm going to be here for 18 months. I need to make friends. So I get into class the first day. I sit next to a young lady named Sarah, and um, <laughs> I, I I come to love and adore Sarah through the years, right? Sarah, let me just describe Sarah a little bit for you. So Sarah is, uh, you know, I my mom was a single mom after my freshman year, my father died in the military. Uh, and so we were like always one check into middle class, right? Like if we missed a check, we would no longer be middle class. So we were like one check into middle class, right? And so my mom struggled to make sure that I could go to these suburban schools because that's what moms do, right? Anyway, so I'm in this school and this school in the suburbs and Sarah is, if I'm, if I'm one paycheck into middle class, Sarah is like Sarah is affluent of affluent, right? She is not one two percent. She's in the one percent. Her dad is like the second in charge at Coca Cola in Atlanta, but we're in Indiana. To the point, just give you some examples. Uh, to the point where, uh, as she called it, Daddy um, Father visitations on the weekends. He would send a personal jet to come pick her up, right, to take her to Atlanta so that they could have um, their time together. I'm just trying to paint a picture, okay? So Sarah and I became besties on like day three when we realized that we had the same birthday. So I had never in all of my 14 years at that time met anyone born on July 29th. I really thought I was like the only unicorn born that day. And then I met Sarah and Sarah was born on the exact same day. And like even like within minutes of me. So we from that point on just said we were twins right now. I mentioned that Sarah was in the 1%. Sarah was also um, white, blonde hair. Uh, and she's a cross country type, right? So I'm a track, she's cross country. So we had a lot of similarities, but we had some definitely some differences. But because we were born on the same day, we told everybody we were twins. And we told that storyline for four years. Uh, and so my senior year, I was a student body president. Don't worry, I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, my senior year, I was student body president and we were, uh, she was on student council with me. And we had, we were preparing some, some kind of event, probably like a homecoming or something. Anyway, we were short for time and we needed to get some, um, we needed to get something. I don't know what it was. Let's just say it was soda or something, right? So we needed to get um, something for this event. So we needed to go to the grocery store. And the, normally what we would do is we'd go back into the verbs, you know, home base <laughs> and and get what we needed. But we were short on time. And the quickest grocery store was actually in the adjoining neighborhood. Um, but that neighborhood was a predominantly black neighborhood and it fed into the public schools. Now, I having just left public schools and because I ran summer track at the high school right in that neighborhood, 
I was very familiar with the area. I was very comfortable with the area. I knew the people in the store. That's how comfortable I was with the, with the area. Uh, and so I must have, I must have had a car. Yeah, I must have had a car. So I said, I was driving and I, and I said, well, we'll just go right here because it's quicker. And so we go into the store and, you know, to this day, I remember, I remember seeing the moment that Sarah became color aware. We walk into the store and I'm like, you know, moving and grooving because that's what <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. I'm moving around, but I noticed that, that Sarah was physically uncomfortable. And I noticed that she was standing really close to me. And then it dawned on me. Hmm. She's having a moment right now. She is experiencing what it's like to be the only one in a room, to be outside of your element and to not feel safe. And I remember coming next to her and just kind of putting my hand, like, you know how you kind of rub your hand next to somebody, let them know how you're there, right? Because I knew what she was going through. And I wanted her to know that she was not alone without making a, a big deal about it, right? So we walk around, and but I also wanted her to experience it. So we're walking around and we're getting stuff, and we get to the register, and I, I knew the gentleman at the register. His name was Sammy, older gentleman. He was always so nice, right? So we get to the register, and I go out of my way to introduce Sarah to Sammy. I'm like, Sammy, I need you to meet my twin. This is Sarah. He's like, hey, twin, I've never met you before. Welcome. Nice to meet you. And so he's, you know, he's engaging with her. She's still physically uncomfortable. She's sweating, but he's trying to let her know that you're okay here, right? And uh, so we leave and we get in the car and and Sarah is physically shaking. And, and I remember sitting in the car and for a minute, I wanted to just let be there in the silence with her so she could feel it all. But I also knew that she didn't know she didn't have the coping mechanisms to deal with what she was going through. And so I remember I grabbed her hand and and, and I said, are you okay? And she goes, oh my gosh, I, feel, I just felt so, I was so scared. I was, and I asked her, so what were you scared of? Because I was the only person in the room. I said, I said, Sarah, that's my world 95, 99% of the time. She says, oh my gosh, I had no idea how horrible that it feels. I said, it is horrible to feel at all times uncomfortable and to not feel like you belong or to feel out of place or to feel like for some reason they're watching you. That, that, that spidey sense that goes up that all eyes are on you and you just can't be, right? And she's like, I had no idea. Like, but she became color aware in that moment. And I believe that that was probably a moment that changed her. When I was at West Point, the same thing happened a lot. And it, it happened to uh, my, 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 uh, my white sisters at West Point because they had never been a minority before in their life. Now, all of the, the, the black students in, in my class, they graduated about 1,000 students, just so you give you some perspective. They graduated about 1,000 students. And um, I, uh, they had about 100 black students and a hundred females for my year group this the statistics have changed a lot lately but this is in 1997 okay and so um they counted me twice right <laughs> so really it's probably you know there were eight there were eight black females and we got counted in both categories right so anyway so um when you grow up as i mentioned when you grow up as an african-american or grow up black you you develop coping mechanisms you develop ways to process being the only one, process being the minority, process the racism and prejudice that you are gonna be exposed to. When you've never been the minority and for the first time in your life you're thrown into that and it is important that someone helps you with coping mechanisms. And at West Point, it was obvious that the, my white sisters did not have those coping mechanisms and they were struggling for the first time being a minority. But what the beautiful thing about it, beyond all the struggle, is one, they learn the value of community, right? Like that is probably our chief coping mechanism is community. Like when I'm in isolation and I feel alone, as soon as I can get back to community, I get back to community because it strengthens me, right? And so that's something that we learn. <clears throat> now, so color aware. Being color aware means you take off the blinders, you see that people are different colors, not that there's a value associated with it, right? That's 
that's the whole supremacy thing that one is superior to the other but that that, that there is a difference but it literally is it's just a surface difference but that surface dif- distant difference excuse me has so much history and so much and and it shapes the way that people see the world and where they experience the world right I think I told this story when I when I was at West Point, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out when I walked into the room, how did they see me? Because then I knew what I knew what myth or what stereotype or what prejudice I was up against. And and at the time, I spent a lot of time trying to combat that. Right. I learned some lessons about that later. So my first one was colorblind. My second one is color where I need you to be color where I need you to take off the blinders, acknowledge it and celebrate that there are differences and those differences help shape people's worldview, how they view the world, how they experience the world, right? If you're colorblind, you can't see the patterns, right? If, 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 if you talk to a person who is colorblind for real, they'll show you that everything is like shades of the same color. Like everything is like a grayish color. And if that's the case, then you won't be able to see the difference between two shades of the same color, right? They just look the same, but they're not. And it's, and, and I mean, like, for example, I got, I got two browns here because I've been painting with these two colors. If I was colorblind, they would both literally be the same color. And if they're the same color then I can't, I won't be able to appreciate the variance that I can get that this one is a, that this one is a deeper hue and this one is a lighter hue and, and, I'm, I would miss all of that. And what I'm saying to you is that when you walk in a world where you're colorblind, then you miss all of that. You miss the beauty that everyone has to bring to the table. So the second one was color wear. Now, my last one is, uh, it's hard for me to say this one, but um, because this is, but I need you to be color bold. And by color bold is don't stand by, right? Like don't, don't just stand by and use your excuse that maybe, well, in my little world, there are no black people, so this is not my issue, right? In my family, in my circles, in my school, there are no black people, and so this is not my issue. This is a, an issue that's way out there, right? I've been talking to a, a number of, of influencers and people in the art industry, and so really I'm specifically talking to the art industry because it is, it is an uncomfortable environment in which we have created, right? Something that is inherently in every person, in every culture is art. And yet, when you look at our, our art industry as it is today, um, it is 99% white, right? It's not that we're not there, because we are here. We are just not, uh, we are oftentimes marginalized or ignored, not given the same opportunities as, 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 uh, as, uh, as white as, as white artists okay so what I what I implore you and so I'm gonna say this statement and it might hit a little bit um, but one of the questions I ha- I was speaking with one of the, the my art friends who's an influencer I was talking about um, the messages that we send right one of the questions you should ask as you are assessing uh, the culture that you create is what are the signs that you're hanging up, right? We have, we kind of define racism as, you know, a, a violent intent to harm someone or um, of, of a different color, right? But that's such a narrow description of racism, right? When we look back in history, which wasn't that long ago, it, it is hard to believe, like my mom lived during the civil rights movement. My mom went to segregated schools, right? So it's not as far as we try to imagine it to be, right? It literally is a generation ago. But I say that all to say is that, uh, you know, she saw the signs that used to say for whites only, right? She saw the signs that said colored only or no blacks allowed, right? And so a lot of us, we would say we are pro- we've progressed because, hey, we don't have those signs up anymore. But there's a difference between we have the signs up, they just are not as blatant anymore. They're, they don't say no, no blacks allowed or they don't say for whites only. But if you look back, and I know this is going to hurt, but if you look back at your design teams for the last 10 years, the last two years, the last five years, and if all of the people who you have selected have been white, then you, in essence, have a sign up that says for whites only. Now, I know that hurts and you're going to say, oh, no, no, I don't discriminate. Um, 
black people are not applying. I would I would definitely pick a black person if a black person applied and if and if you know their 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 art uh, personified what 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 my what I what the brand that I was trying to display, right? Right? That's what you're gonna say. I already know it. Well let me just tell you this. We are here, we do apply, but after you get told no ten times, you kind of stop because it hurts every time, right? And so what you do is what I know what I do is I go to a brand and I'll say, I'll look at this brand and I don't want to pick on it for any person in particular, but I'll go to a brand and I'll go back and I'll look on their website and I'll look at every design team they've had. And if I see not a single black person or if I see the one alibi black person and that was like three years ago, then I kind of move on right? Like, I don't necessarily, I would love to be on the design team because that's how we grow. But I'm not going to base my value, my value as an artist on whether or not I'm welcome there, right? Like, you, like I said, when someone doesn't invite you to the party, you create your own parties. But I can't, me, as a, as a, as the type of person I am, I cannot keep, keep walking without letting you know where you're screwing up, right? And, and that's where you're screwing up. I, I was doing an assessment over the weekend just because I wanted to see how bad it really was. And, and, and it's not just design teams. It's your designers, your product designers. If you have no product designers, and yet look at my space. I clearly consume a lot of product. I got ideas. I, may, I, do, I do my mad science. So, so whether or not you're going to let me be your product designer or not, I'm going to create my own products. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you got product designers out there. It's it's your product designers. It's your it's your design teams. It's your it's who you invite to be uh, guest bloggers on your on your website. It's who you promote. It's it's the heartbreaking ones for me as a teacher. It's you know your teacher panels. If you host one of those summits or year long teaching programs and you literally for the last ten years have had one black teacher you got a problem because we're here right now if you have historically put up signs that said no no black people allowed we're not going to keep trying to break in so now you have to become color bold and find us you have to find us and there's ways to find us you ask you ask someone like myself hey rachel do you know any any mixed media teachers who would be interested in being a teacher in my summit yes i've got a list of 10. i've got a list of 20. you know what i'm saying i have that now i've always had it <laughs> no one has asked me for it right and so I, i'm trying to remove the excuses because once we can remove the excuses then then you have to look yourself in the mirror and say okay I'm comfortable being around people that look just like me and and deal with it. Whatever that is that deal with that. Right. Because there's a lie you're believing that you're comfortable with and we got to confront that. Another one that 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 really bothered me this weekend was if you have a, if you have a teaching platform, right, like you hot, you get teachers to come onto your platform and teach art courses an online teaching platform and I went to one of the prominent teaching platforms and they, I counted, I counted like this, right? One, two, three. They had 95 teachers. I went through 95 teacher names, zero, not one, not one black teacher, not one, not one. And I know of at least five who who are doing the darn thing. And there's no reason why they shouldn't be a teacher on your platform or at least have it been extended the invitation. Now, if they have been extended the invitation and they decline for whatever reason, then then I apologize. But I'm just telling you optically what it looks like to someone to someone coming behind me is you have a sign that says for whites only up on your website. Now, the request is for you to be color bold, to be intentional at this point. You see the problem and now you have to say, am I going to continue and per perpetuate the problem or am I going to do something about it? And that's where we are. That's where we are. That's where we are. Now, how does this 
is this a is this a direct impact to police brutality no but we don't just march for police brutality police brutality is one huge festering symptom in our messed up jacked up system that we need to correct and so one of the other way one of the other pieces in the system is the industries in which we have influence i can't i uh, i don't know how much impact i can have on other industries but on this one i'm going to raise some flags because one i love this industry and i know the joy that that this industry can give to people how it can heal them how it can transform how it can help them health wise and so for me to to not be passionate about changing something that has so much effect on the mental health of a people you know most revolutions happen they start in the arts and we have opportunity so my request is that one don't be color blind be color aware take the blinders off see the color assess how you are operating look to see if you have signs up that say for for whites only and be intentional be color bold i didn't make that phrase up as a young lady named melody hobson who 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 has a ted talk if you want to know what she means by color bold be color bold seek out diversity right like paintings are beautiful you can have a beautiful painting that's all one color you can but oh my gosh look how much more interesting that painting is because there's red because there's white because there's yellow because there's black because there's green how much more interesting is that painting because all the colors get to play together versus just having a piece of white paper up or even a piece of just solid black paper i know i went probably too long so I would love to continue this conversation and if you have any questions send me your questions i'm i'm a little exhausted but you know this fight is a marathon and my hope is that my little priscilla who is five years old and who loves art and who who is has an amazing gift with art that when she gets older she will feel 100 percent that she belongs in that space that's that's what drives me. It may not change for me. The damage may be done for this generation, but for Priscilla, I fight. I want her to be able to play with all the colors and be welcome. Thank you.